GPT opened everybody's eyes, exposing this technology as the best in history. At the end of the day, it'll come back to security hygiene. It'll come back to like locking your doors and, uh, and your windows and, and sort of ensuring that these basics are well handled because again, technology amplifies. And so whatever flaw yeah. here, it, the flaws wouldn't be very different, but the more auto-generated, the more you amplify the generation, the more you multiply the security risk. That's like ops in the cloud. Is that really a possibility? So if you have been in the cloud security space for some time and you are a cybersecurity leader, you probably would understand the concept of security champions program, DevSecOps, cloud security, and all of that. But what you may or may not have noticed is that Amazon, since this year, has started talking about security champions program as well and reinforce at other places. And if you actually try searching for this, for some reason, Amazon is the only CSP which is talking about security champions program. Azure and Google Cloud have versions. But what they're really talking about is champions of their software rather than, hey, we need people beyond the security team to help us solve these security challenges. So cloud security is becoming more aware. And as leaders probably listening to this conversation as part of the Cybersecurity Leaders Month, you probably would want to know what is upcoming in the cloud security space and not just from a perspective of, hey, I found a vulnerability, I've barricaded my crime scene as a police officer, and now we're ready to solve the crime. This is more around the fact of security champions program, DevSecOps in cloud. Is that even possible? For this, we had Guy Pujani. He is the founder of Sneak and also the host of the Secure Developer Podcast, which talks about DevSecOps, security champions. That's basically AppSec space is entirely what they're covering. So it was really great to have Guy Po come and talk about coming from founding multiple companies and working with large companies like Akamai and stuff, and now the founder of Sneak for the past little over seven years now. So it's also really interesting to hear what he was noticing as a pattern from the generative AI capability, how would that affect cloud security as well as AppSec security, whether AppSec and CloudSec can exist together, and what are some of the patterns that he's learned from other people who have come on the show? What are some of the cloud security trends he has seen in his show where he has spoken to many cybersecurity leaders about this very topic? If you know someone who is a cybersecurity leader or wanting to be a cybersecurity leader and wants to understand the space broadly as it stands in 2023, so you can plan your cloud security program or know what you should be upskilling or looking out for as you kind of grow a more holistic cybersecurity program for yourself in 2023, this episode is definitely for you. And by the way, if you're here for the second, third or fourth time listening in or watching on your YouTube, LinkedIn or Apple and Spotify, Definitely give us a follow, subscribe, and leave us a review or rating. It definitely helps us find more amazing guests like Gaipo and others who come and share the knowledge freely. I hope you really enjoyed this conversation between me and Gaipo, where we peeled off the layers between the DevSecOps and the cloud and the product world, whether they combine together, or are we just going to be talking about CSPMs and CPMs or whatever other C acronym the Gartner is going to come and introduce to us as well. So that's what the conversation was. I hope you enjoyed this. And this is also the last episode for the Cybersecurity Leader Month. So just an FYI, next month is going to be about Kubernetes security because we would be at KubeCon EU, which is Amsterdam. And also we would be at the RSA conference, which is probably the biggest cybersecurity conference in the world. It's going to be in San Francisco. So we'll be in Amsterdam and San Francisco next month. Definitely say hello if you're there in person. I would love to take a picture with you. By the way, I run something called the RSA Fashion Week. So if you are dressed up and like me into men's fashion or ladies fashion or fashion in general, definitely come say hello. I'd love to take a picture and post it on my social media as well because we love to show the other side of cybersecurity as well. All right, I would let you enjoy this episode and I'll talk to you in the next episode. Peace. Hey, Guy, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Ashish, happy to be here. Appreciate that. So I doubt people don't know who Guy po is, but for the one or two audience members who probably have never heard of Guy po, what was your journey into the current space you're in? Yeah, so I'm the, I guess I'm kind of at the moment best known for being the founder of Sneak. For it, you know, my journey is kind of having gone through got into security a little bit in the uh, cyber parts of the Israeli army, went into application security kind of back in 2002 when the sort of the first AppSec pioneers uh, Sanctum, they got acquired by Watchfire, they got acquired by IBM. And then I left and I founded a web performance company and was kind of part of the first wave of DevOps in the Velocity Conference. And that company got acquired by Akamai, where I was CTO for a bunch of years. And then after a few kind of great years at Akamai, you know, learning how to sort of operate there at scale. I got the H to do another startup and I left to, to found Sneak, which you know, to a large extent kind of merged my kind of AppSec and security journey with my DevOps journey to kind of build security for developers and we kind of try to bring the DevOps ethos, you know, as a solution provider to the world of security. So very brief nutshell, that's my... Pretty, pretty awesome brief history as well there. I was going to ask, because you've been in leadership position yourself, you've been a CTO, 
and you talk to other leaders as well. And this being the cybersecurity leader month and cloud security leader month. So for the leaders listening, and I, the moment I say the word DevSecOps, some of, some of them would definitely roll their eyes and like, oh my God, here, here we go again. But how would you describe DevSecOps? And because I guess you're in that whole shift left movement when it was starting off as well. So probably one of the few people talking about it at that point in time. How do you describe DevSecOps to people who are leaders at this point in time? I think like fundamentally, DevSecOps is around bringing the security world into the world of DevOps. And, you know, the kind of the ethos of DevOps includes a bunch of things, but probably like two core components of it are continuous deployment in, by independent teams that own the applications end to end. And so DevOps, again, amidst many, and you kind of ask, you know, three people, you get five opinions about what DevOps is, but fundamentally, you know, it focuses on, you know, instead of these sort of big, long iterations of, you know, requirements and, you know, delivery, you go to something that is, that is much more agile, much more iterative. And to make that work at scale, you have to reduce dependencies. You have to allow teams to operate independently, which in turn kind of got translated technically into things like microservices and such, like trying to create software boundaries that also allow those teams to iterate. And so there's a lot of evolutions. And in security, by and large, doesn't tend to operate that way. You know, it tends to operate in a more centralized fashion, it tends to operate in a more, you know, sort of external entity that audits, you know, like its core, its roots is in auditing and finding problems, finding mistakes in it. And, and it just doesn't work for this fast pace in team model of DevOps. And so DevSecOps is around rethinking security to say, how can you build secure software in a way that at the end of the day predicates on, on these teams operating and securing what they're doing. And you still need very much the security team, security leaders, but security teams need to change from being the people securing the system, the people auditing and assessing it to being a platform team, to being an enabler that mm -hmm. makes these independent teams successful as they you know, build it and own it and run it you know, over time. So to me, that's the sort of the core of DevSecOps. I think it gets translated. I have this sort of the long-winded answer here, but you know, it gets translated into these sort of three aspects. I had this talk of three phases of DevSecOps. Some people think of DevSecOps as like first and foremost DevSecOps technologies. So think, well, if you're doing container security, you're doing DevSecOps. And it's because it's associated, the container technology is associated with this world of DevOps. And so it does introduce some new technologies you have to secure. There is the notion of DevOps methodologies, and so like you know, put a security control in a continuous deployment pipeline, you know, mm -hmm. or cloud, you know, the whole kind of world of cloud. But for me, really, it's around that sort of shared ownership. It's around that decentralization of security that is the core of it. Oh, as this is interesting because it is already happening in the cloud space where you know you're finding that security people are being part of development teams as security architects or engineers or how we're going to use it. Do you feel like DevSecOps from when you started talking about it with the shift left and everything. It's been a while, right? I think I've been talking about DevSecOps, I feel like for years, but you've been talking for much longer. So do you feel like since the time you started talking about it, because it was almost like an uphill battle, I imagine when, wait, what do you mean we have a decentralized security? Because we've always operated this way to today. Do you feel there has been a level of maturity or do we feel the needle hasn't really moved much in the implementation of DevSecOps? I think, first of all, I want to differentiate a little bit between DevSecOps and shift left, and they're very related, but they're not the same. Like to me, shift left okay. predate DevSecOps because shift left, you know, I was saying that back in 2002 before DevOps for agile really. And it was just about the premise that you want to find problems early. I think in the world mm -hmm. of security and cloud security is no different in that it tends to be very detect and respond, you know, very like I'll find the problems when they operate as they get deployed. And yep. I want to find them earlier. Like, you know, it's just that much cheaper, that much more effective, you know, the, to, to find the problems earlier. And the end result of that is that you fix more issues. And even it was when it's a year long cycle to release something and it's not at all in the cloud, you still need to shift left or still want to shift left. Um, yeah. I think yeah. the difference is that in the world of cloud and DevOps, the need for that is greater. But so it was just sort of like a little bit of a differentiation. No, I I'm glad you clarified it. So where do you feel the maturity is at this point in time? Yeah, I think the industry has matured here, but it is not evenly distributed. And so I think what has happened is that you have large enough companies that have grown in this context of DevOps, in this context of cloud, you know, they're cloud native, truly. And... For those organizations, it's just not realistic. It's not practical to sort of apply security in that sort of a central fashion. And, and so 
like it or not, they evolve and they built a bunch of these practices. And, you know, there's a bunch of things that you can see that demonstrate that. There's in the world of, of product security, for instance, application security, you see, so I host the Secure Developer podcast, as you mentioned before, and I get to talk to these sort of smart security leaders, oftentimes with like a dev and AppSec bias. And, you know, you ask consistently, you ask about like the traits, the sort of the properties and skills that they want in the people that they hire. And, you know, now there's kind of much more acceptance that the key skill is almost like development skills, is the ability to build a platform. And they feel like they can teach security more easily than they can teach sort of the development. But even if they do teach, you know, the ones that are talking about, you know, broader skills and coming from security, they feel like they need to enable or like have someone with the aptitude to sort of learn coding. So, you know, and in general, a lot more about like automate problems. So I think that appreciation of like, you want to automate is a big yeah. deal. I think the appreciation oh, yeah. of the shift left of like the dev security has also grown. And I think we're sort of at, at this inflection point now, which is, so, you know, Snake is almost eight years old, you know, sort of seven and a half years old now. And, and at the beginning, I let's say the sort of the reactions were much more split when I talked about developer for security, you talk about, you know, the need and the criticality of developer security. I think everybody was like, yeah, it'll be better. But the <laughs> skepticism around whether it can be done or not, you know, was that was high. I think today I rarely encounter that. There's still criticism. There are still a lot of challenges, but I think much of the industry now is in a place that doesn't doubt that you need to get to developer security. But now there's a need of like a new set of capabilities and tools for product security teams. And, and cloud is like, uh, we can talk about that. You know, cloud is a little bit in sort of the idea that there's overlaps there um, mm -hmm. in, in saying, okay, I need to run a security program that is developer centric. It doesn't mean yep. it's sort of developer first, it's very far from developer only, but I need to run it. And so, so I think those demands for these tools, the sort of the frequency of skills, I do think there's been an evolution, but I think the world of security is, uh, still has a ways to go in words stands. And I think another word that I came across recently, I don't know if it's Twitter or somewhere, but it was, so someone said DevSecOps shift left and they also had start left. And I'm like, I, cause the whole conversation was, oh, shift left should marry start left. And I'm going to start left. That's an, that's an interesting, I don't know if, have you heard the term before start left? I haven't heard the term, but you know, I think people sort of, in, in practice, shift left is, you know, when you sort of look at the knowledge, like you think of the language, it's actually, it's, it's a false statement because now, you know, it's all about that infinite loop, that continuity. And so we're, like, where's left? <laughs> like where, where have you, you know, it's, it's continuous. There is no shift left. And so really, I think the sort of the true, the true change is, is the decentralization. So it's really about top to bottom. It's more yeah. about saying, okay, how can a dev team that, you know, now, unlike in 2002, when I was sort of using that term, you know, owns the pager, you know, if you will, right? Like they, you know, they own quality. They yeah. own a lot more of the operation. How, how can they own security? And when you think about it, they own the pager. I mean, oftentimes being the first ones to be paged on something that looks like an operational issue, but it might be, you know, a security issue. But then yeah. increasingly it's the SOC. Like you still need security specialists to understand if yeah. someone's attacking. So it is in different state. But it's yeah. So start left. I mean, you always <laughs> everything starts <laughs> yeah. when you're writing the code, right? I, or you start. Mean, that's you start. You always start on the left, right? Because someone is clearly typing the yeah. code somewhere. So you kind of are starting on the left technically. So maybe it doesn't yeah. make it sense. Probably like a more a more broadly used term that is good is a secure by design. Secure uh, design. And so yeah. those programs you do sort of see a lot. And to an extent, it's probably the same sentiment, which is, can you, can you design it to be secure before you've written the first line of code? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I, I love the example that you gave about developers being the first with the pager, I guess, pager duty or whatever they use at this point in time for getting the notification, because a lot of conversations around threat modeling used to be similar as well. As a security person or as an AppSec person, I would have a team member go in and do threat modeling, but that was the first time they're looking at this application that they've never seen before. Whereas an application developer who develops the application has been looking at it every day, probably for the last five, six years. They know every hole in it. They're probably best suited to do a set modeling session than the security person walking into the room. But anyway, I'm going to leave that for another conversation, but I definitely feel it's the developers definitely need to have more power, but then it comes with a flip side of how do you balance this? And this is kind of where I would love to segue into the whole cloud conversation as well. You mentioned because you're the host for the secure developer, where you speak to a lot of leaders, cybersecurity leaders about what they're seeing and what they're expecting as roles or a skill set as well. 
is there a trend for cloud security that you're seeing there as well? Because I'm sure it's like blending in everywhere now. It is. And, you know, cloud is messy. It's very, very big. And I think we've sort of spoken about this before, maybe in the past conversation. But I think we're, we're conflating too many things into the title of cloud. Mm -hmm. And that in turn, you know, creates confusion, you know, because you say cloud security and, you know, three people will have different interpretations, three different interpretations of what that means. To me, the, the first of all, the, the key distinction that I, that I like to make is between the IT cloud and the app cloud. So I think one way to sort of, you know, divide the beast is to say, for some applications, the cloud is a sort of API enabled data center. It's a place in which you host an application you bought or you outsourced or, you know, you kind of lifted and shifted. It doesn't have that complexity of the sort of the dev ownership, the, all of those, it is an application that you're operating as a somewhat black box. And so as someone securing it, you have a lot more control. It's, you know, it's in your domain, but you don't really know what's inside. And so you secure all around it, you know, authorization, network, you know, sort of assets around segregation. And, you know, I think a lot of the cloud use today, you can argue maybe the majority of the cloud use today is in that sort of IT cloud world. And to an extent, it's easier it's much more the evolution of IT security. It's much more the evolution of data centers. And I think most of people talking about cloud security, they talk about that. And in that case, you don't need to worry about dev teams. You don't need to worry about shift life too much. You know, it's, if you have a problem, you don't go to your dev team, you go to a vendor that you purchased, yep. a contractor you used. The app cloud is very, very different. It's the place in which you deploy your applications. And that's the place in which the cloud is, is just a continuation of software. It's just a symptom. Of, of the code, you know, you're using infrastructure as code and you're deploying it. You can't fix anything that's been deployed. You have to go back to the source code and modify the source code to Terraform file or the actual literal software or the Kubernetes configure, the serverless YAML, like right? more and more things that are, are, are earlier in the sort of closer to the application development. So, so definitely there's like a shared ownership of where you fixed it. Some things are in the dev and some in the IT. Applications changed a lot more often. So all of these like fancy kind of AI based modeling of how the application behave and all of that, they're much harder to apply because the application change. You have multiple versions running at the same time because you'd have yeah. like a canary release and a blue green train and a, you know, you, you, so it's a, it's a different world. And I think it's one in which you have to get development participation. Like you can't be successful in that world without dev ownership. And so I think that division is important and what I'm hearing in sort of talking to sort of security leaders, whether it's at the CISO level or or sort of in product security world, is oftentimes there is cloud related responsibilities and they talk about cloud configuration, but but really it, it depends on your lens. If you say cloud security and you mostly mean IT security, then they see that primarily as an operations team, as a SecOps problem. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know they need to collaborate a little bit. If you're primarily thinking about cloud in the context of your applications in the cloud and the SaaS application you're hosting, they oftentimes see it and, often, and sometimes even like literally organizationally put it under a product security mantle that includes that responsibility. Funny how it sounds exactly like what you just mentioned about DevSecOps before, the person who holds the pager, like the application developer. Clearly, in that scenario, they're not the ones looking after cloud security. There's the SOC operations kind of gets involved later on. And it's funny, I agree on the cloud security space being a bit messy also because of the four C's that Gartner came up with. Now, everywhere you kind of look, the whole four C's of CSPM, CNAP, I mean, I can keep going. There's a few more C's coming up after that as well, just to confuse people. I guess what I find is a lot of people, A, either they don't know about these terms and they're always told, hey, you should just go for a CSPM. Then there's another category that have never heard of this, right? I think... I would love to kind of get your perspective and because this is targeted at a leadership level conversation as well, but I think it should still be valid for other people as well. Why is the Gartner narration of the whole four C's and five C's or however C's they want to add, why is that important for the cybersecurity space when they come out and just say, oh, there's a new category called CNAP or I guess ASPM or whatever. Why is that important? Well, I think it's a fast moving space. And, and as we've even just sort of discussed, it's messy and people yeah. have different interpretations. And so people are confused. And I think existing security leaders, depending on kind of where they come from, either way, they need to evolve their practices. And the reality is that like legacy tech never dies. And so you, you can't just think about cloud. Like the few companies that or the younger companies that are entirely cloud-based and that were sort of born in the cloud, they need it a little bit less because they just say security. Like I don't need, I don't need the C at the beginning. I just need to sort of say, how do I do sort of security operations? How do you do secure development? You know, how do I they don't need the cloud? I think for most organizations, for most of the big organizations that were born before the cloud, they have a mix. And so they need 
things to equate. They need to understand the areas of difference between their sort of pre-cloud and post-cloud surroundings. And those changes across, you know, happen across the board and they're very confusing and they tend to be, you know, by definition, most people will not be experts in all of these different spaces. And so cloud needs, there's kind of, you know, different things that cloud offers you, right? Like one is the, is just the sort of the elasticity and, you know, the move to it. So you might need tools that just technically are able to operate in a cloud environment and run there. And then subsequently you need to sort of think about the rethinking, okay, how do I do, you know, XDR in the cloud? Mm. You know, it's, it is uh, it is necessary off cloud and it is necessary in cloud, but it's a little bit different tools. You know, the elastic infrastructure means you need to have different approaches to how do you, uh, you know, spin up or down a machine or the API maybe enables a few things. And then you have the actual true kind of cloud security capabilities of new things you can do in the cloud. Maybe it's, you know, you can now, if you're using whatever containers or like mutable images, then you can just shut down a compromised machine and it'll come back up versus, you know, worrying about not being able to reprovision it. You know, maybe the, you know, the visibility that you have in the cloud, the cloud is much more sort of auditable than IT. So maybe you can be smarter about identifying things. So all of these are new capabilities and, and, and they're all kind of interrelated. So the CSPM, like, you know, you need to know what is deployed. You need to know how it's operating. And so I think they use these like Gartner categories and all those, they're never perfect. You know, sometimes they're amazing, but I think what they do is they give you an anchor to -hmm. say, okay, this is like the thing we relate to Mm -hmm. and it helps sort out some of this confusion. And in doing it, they help the conversation. Uh, The challenge is that they also carry a lot of commercial. I think, I, I think what is not a good practice is to start your RFCs from it. Like, I don't think you need a CNAP solution. You need to think about your security problems. You need to look at the CNAP category, which is, by the way, massive and like practically no sort of satisfies it to that extent. And you should look at that as like, these are all the needs. So identify from those, what are the capabilities that are actually kind of important to you? To your point, if you just go back to the first principle of why do we do security in the first place? Like the CNAP and CDSPM and all of that just doesn't really matter at that point in time. What are you trying to protect and what do you require as a tool to protect that? It's kind of basically the bottom line of where people are trying to get you. It. It's also a good way for me to talk about something else which has been brewing in my mind about the whole cloud space as well, where Amazon recently in their Airbnb Reinforced conference, I think the CISO of Amazon.com, uh, Steve Schmidt, he kind of came up and spoke about the whole security champions program. And he, I, I think so far, funny enough, and this was, this was one of the reasons why it was an inspiration. That was kind of like the inspiration for having this episode with you as well, where hey, wait, Amazon is talking about security champions program. They had someone from one of the companies, she spoke about how she's been running a security champions program for years and how it's been helpful. But Azure, Google Cloud, they're not running a security champions program or they're not even, sorry, I'm sure they're running internally, but they're not talking about it that, hey, customers, you need to start a security champions program. But Amazon is saying it. They have this version of, I think, hey, you are, and I guess for lack of a better word, they are called AWS heroes. The similar version in GCP as well as Azure as well. Considering Amazon is already starting the conversation about Security Champions program. And as I was saying, you've been in the whole shift left DevSecOps conversation for a long time. And now we're kind of starting to see, I guess, the beginnings of it from Amazon and as they've been leading the curve for a long time. In your mind, the whole conversation started with, is DevSecOps possible in cloud? What would a Security Champion program usually look like? A lot of the leaders who may be listening to this have never done this and maybe are starting the journey as CISOs of a cloud world. What does the security champion program look like? Why is it important? Yeah, I, mean, I think so, so as far as security champions is nothing new in the sort of the AppSec space. It is a great thing and you're seeing a greater adoption of it right now. And it really boils down to like how much have you gotten to a place in which you're dependent on developers building something secure in the first place. And so I think the cloud world has a lot of its roots in that sort of IT cloud world. And to be frank, in IT cloud, you don't need a security champions program. Like you are in control, you're deploying a thing. You need to buy secure software. You need your contractors to produce secure software. But if you're running a black box and you know, that's what you're doing, you're not, you don't need a security champions program. You just need a secure infrastructure thing to run. You need kind of good monitoring. And so, so I'd sort of say like the first thing is to sort of acknowledge a division that is along the line, not to use these terms, right. But of the IT cloud versus the app cloud, Mm -hmm. I think within the app cloud, you know, in, in AppSec world, security champions have been there for a long while. 
And it comes for two reasons. You know, one is, so you know, maybe let's first define what a security champions program is, right? So security champions has a bunch of definitions, but really they're security champions, security community, mostly. They both orient at getting the people building the software to have better security competency around them. Security champions is typically something around saying, hey, one developer per team or one developer per sort of multiple teams who has more interest and more aptitude around security. Let's sort of find those people, create a community around them, have them be a bit of a bridge to the security team, to, you know, historically to the AppSec team mostly, yep. and equip them with tools. And then you'd find sometimes very, very loosely defined, you know, maybe all the way to a security community, which is just like, create a Slack group for these people or a Slack channel, you know, just sort of share practices and, and uh, you know, post messages all the way to things like, you know, Medallia and Twilio are running like certifications in their security champions program. You'd sort of have, you know, Yahoo, Sean Poor is there sort of building a program that really connects like back bounties and security champions talking about all the communities, all the sort of augmentations. And, uh, and, and so, you know, you can get very fancy mm -hmm. and it is there to, to sort of achieve these sort of two things. One is an augmentation of your security team. So it's just the fact that there aren't enough security people to kind of keep up with all of those. And so you want to crowdsource some sort of security help. So how do you sort of, you know, some osmosis going? And then yep. the second is within development is to build something secure in the first place. So it's to, you mentioned before, the sort of the gap in knowledge of the application between the security person being paged and, and an application developer and knowing yep. the application. And so say, well, if we planted security expertise within the sort of the app teams, then you would have people that have both, you know, to a sufficient degree and they can make the decisions or they can at least act as a mediator because they would speak both language and they can translate. And so security champion programs are super important because you have to get that last thing done. When you look at Google, like you mentioned Google and, and Microsoft kind of post-transformation, Microsoft historically hasn't been very good at security. And, and then at some point kind of, you know, turn the dial and, you know, Azure is as great at it as is the AWS. The reason they do that is not because they have a great response system. Like, yes, they also respond well, but it's because they have good infrastructure that addresses a bunch of things and they have good security awareness ahead of time. And so they're running, whether they call it a security champions program or not, the security awareness and security activity and security engagement of their developers is much higher than in most companies. And as a result of that, they have a security system that prevents, that doesn't have a lot of security flaws in the first place. And then let me just sort of wrap up. Like it's a big topic, security champions. We could have spoken yeah. for, like, you know, at length about that alone, but to sort of wrap up with like why cloud with your initial question of like, you know, what, why are we hearing now? And I think what's happening is like the more over time, the boundaries between software and the app cloud are blurring, you know, the cloud eventually its promise is to, is to make kind of infrastructure disappear, you know, is to just sort of say like, run this for me, yeah. you know, like yeah. make this run. Here's like my parameters of what matters to me and then make it run, make it run well. And, and the best applications are ones that leverage this, right? They sort of, they leverage the elasticity of the cloud. They leverage, you know, sort of service mesh and authorization to do things, but they intertwine the sort of the application capabilities with the cloud capabilities. They codify the cloud infrastructure as code capabilities. And so all of those make the cloud increasingly dependent, the app cloud make it increasingly dependent on developers to be successful. And so I think that's the reason you're starting to hear more and more of the term security champions in the cloud security world, while it was already alive and well and growing in the application security space. I think there are also roles appearing which are blending into the two pieces as well. Some of our previous guests were CISOs as well. I think Stu Hurst, who's a CISO of Trustpilot, he's openly came up with the role for product security people where it's a combination of cloud security and AppSec. Like it's basically like in his mind, those teams would blend in and I kind of agree with that as well, where eventually that would happen. You can either start today and make them work together where it's to what you said earlier, if the application or the app cloud, as you called out, is being deployed or developed by your entire organization is going in the cloud, has a developer, needs threat modeling, needs the whole security champions program, and at the same time, needs to have the active infrastructure, but still secure. It kind of made sense at that point in time, but it also opens another door where, well, clearly we're not there yet. we would probably a long time to go, but I also feel the IT cloud piece, which you kind of mentioned, where there might not be a need for a security champions program. May want to challenge you a bit on this just because I feel like, you know, how IT cloud, the whole SaaS world is 
for make a simple example, like people who use Office 365, HR departments or marketing teams might use Facebook and all of that. Those SaaS services, they upload data there. So there is probably a security awareness thing there more than, but I feel like the more PaaS services come in with platform as a service and sysadmins turn into more your cloud admins or IT admins, do you reckon that would shift as well? When that kind of starts going on from a SaaS is not good enough because I want to really customize whatever this SAP application that I've been using for a long time for my HR, suddenly I'm looking at a PaaS platform from SAP. Do you feel like that would change as yeah. well? Or at the moment, do you see where you see it would stand? No, I think I think it's a very good point that you that you raise, and, and it just goes to show how ambiguous the term "cloud" is, because you know the, the definition I talked about was really mostly in IaaS, world. Mm. like in infrastructure as a service, you have the IT cloud and the sort of the app cloud. It's true that it, it moves a little bit into PaaS, and then on the yeah. in the other lens, you have the SaaS that moves yeah. into sort of PaaS, and and. SaaS is its own cloud, so to speak. And you, sort <laughs> yeah. of, you, you can kind of say that if the app cloud's future is abstracting infrastructure and becoming part of the code, the IT cloud's future is SaaS. Is you know, there's there's generally very few people that want to host software. You know, most yeah. of the time, like you you might be forced to host software when doing it, but most of the time you would rather use a SaaS or like something that's sort of you know in the infrastructure to do that for you. And then within that, those become applications. And you're absolutely correct that all the sort of the no code or like the more customizable system is, the more, you know, rope you sort of get, you know, to, to hang yourself with, you know, the more people yeah, will yeah. accidentally do so. And so you do, you do need to do those. So, I mean, you're right, you know, it, it is important to do that as well. I think it's just sort of not a, those are, there's smaller worlds. So there's a numbers element. So the number mm -hmm. of typically like sysadmins dealing with a Salesforce or an SAP or, a, you know, whatever platform and developing uh, they just tend to be in an organization substantially smaller than the number of developers. And so yeah. things like security champions programs, they tend to be required when there's just like a larger community. And so oh, you right. need yeah. these champions kind of floating around in it. But the concept of it is true, you know, and r really, I think in everything in security, you want the security knowledge and awareness to be as close as possible to the decision. That's really what we want is we want the person making the decision yeah. Uh, to make a secure decision to doing it, whether it's a, so if it's phishing and, you know, the person making the decision on clicking a link or not is the individual, is the user, you know, sort of getting the email. Yeah. And yeah. so at the yeah. end of the day, you want them to make a secure decision at that time. If it's, if it's like an application that's being developed, then you want the application developer making the decision to do it. If it is a, you know, a, a Salesforce configuration or sort of, or sometimes almost code, you know, they yeah. get sort of written that, you know, gives access to do it. You want that. And so I think you always, that's the, the essence of shift left, you know, in concept is the move the security responsibility, awareness, visibility to be as close as it can be to the decision. Yeah. I think it's a good point you called out about the custom code as well. That reminded me that I think one of my CISOs wrote before, I, it was a SaaS service, a tech company running on a SaaS and our end users would sometimes put JavaScript code in it because there was an option to put something and they just like, oh, I don't like the way this is rendering this way. I just want to change it. And without letting us know, sometimes you find pen chests, hey, why is there a JavaScript running on the front end? <laughs> and it turns out they've been storing JavaScript on the other side. Anyway, it's like, to, that probably opens another can of firm, which requires another whole lot of yeah, yeah. conversation. I also wanted to ask, maybe this is kind of where Security Champions Program, we defined it. What are some of the harder parts? Because I imagine like most of the conversation that I end up having with people around the DevSecOps and, and the whole DevSecOps and cloud as well is more around the fact that, hey, developers don't want another thing to look after. It's just, oh, well, I look after performance. I, now I look after QA as well. Like I think the Jesus, like there is that whole thing about we don't need QA anymore. The test coverage needs to be quite high. And now I have to do security as well. And I will talk to my product owner or whatever. Like I think, do you see that? And have you ever and you know, figured out a solution for that as well, or maybe tricks to work around it. We hope you're enjoying the episode so far. A quick word from our sponsor, Sneak, who are having a special event, Sneak Launch, on April 4th, 2023. They're going to be talking about how to deploy and develop securely in the cloud, and you can register for this free on their website, sneak.io slash events slash sneak launch. Now let's get back to the episode. I think it's real, you know, the challenge of, you know, needing to doing it. And it's really about that complete ownership, right? So if in the world of DevOps, you have a team, the team, you know, owns the application they're building and they own it end to end, that includes a lot of things. It includes 
you know, the application's functionality, it includes, you know, its quality and the elements, it includes its operability, which is a, a newer, relatively speaking, responsibility. It includes costs and it includes, of course, you know, many accessibility and performance. And, and of course, it also includes security. And so yep. the responsibility isn't new. It's the acceptance of the responsibility that we're trying to evolve. But I think the key to focus on, like the responsibilities are already there. And generally speaking, developers want to build an application that is amazing on all of those fronts. And there is a certain amount of zero sum game because, you know, they only have so much effort doing it. So really the name of the game is to make it easier for them to do so and to not give up on it. And so I think for the developer side, we're trying to provide visibility and ease. Visibility because security is naturally invisible, right? Like you don't know that you've made a security mistake. Functionality yeah. is visible, bugs sometimes not, but there's a finite set of questions of like, how would it behave in this scenario? And so it's much more mentally, well, even performance and, you know, operations, like you, you notice that the system keeps getting, going down. Hopefully your system doesn't keep getting hacked, you know, like that's, off, that's not a great feedback loop. And so you have to create visibility and there's a tricky balance because uh, you know visibility can quickly become noise and so that's where sort of you know good prioritization and good accuracy needs to needs to come into play and so visibility is the first thing you have to provide and you need tolerance from the development team to, to accept this responsibility and then the other is ease of use i think the the problem in the industry has been when visibility came in the form of like you know a, a 300 page pdf of all the vulnerabilities was found in your sort of system and that's just not helpful and so you have to think about the whole journey of what the developer needs to do with this now and say, well, the developer, first of all, they need to fix, they don't need to do it. So how do you make it easier to fix? You need to prioritize, yeah. you need to contextualize it to their application. Don't start with a risk context, start with an application context, you know, and yeah. you need to, to, to match it into their, their methodologies, you know, like you're one of the sort of the hidden features that I love most in, in Sneak, you know, but they sort of just often omit it because it gets a bit complex is the notion that like a pull request is where a code review happens. It's not a pipeline. It's a code yep. review action. And so, yes, you can plant a full on test, you know, in that thing, because that's easier to do because you can just run that in build as well. But really what you want, what the developer is doing at that point in time is they're doing code review. So they only want to know what problems introduced in the changes that they've made. They don't want to know about all the other problems. They just want to know about those problems. So those and like many others, to be frank, was kind of the secret of success for Sneak. It's around starting from the lens of usability for the developer. Mm. So I think really, like I get a lot of pushback to it, but from developers, you need those. And from security teams, which are probably more of the listeners of this podcast, you have to persevere. You know, like at the end of the day, if you keep finding the problems after they're deploying and put all of your energy and all of your cycles in how do you detect and respond a vulnerability after the fact, you're yeah. never going to win. Like you're never going to get to a good place. It's just never, ever going to work. You know, if you keep this dissing kind of developers and sort of saying they don't care about security versus embracing a kind of an empathetic, like, how can I help you type approach, then you're never going to be embraced. Like it's, it's going to be a war. And I think if you take anything from the sort of the DevOps playbook, which has taken, like, it's worth remembering, you know, that operations were in the same boat, actually in many places still haven't fully matured either of saying, throw it over the wall, someone else would run it, someone else would operate it, they would find problems, go back to So, and if it was more IT cloud operation and the controls were in their space, if it was more sort of, you know, dynamic. And today, I think there's a lot more acceptance. There's a lot more sort of pride in dev teams when they can, you know, build operable software. And so it took a long time and it's still undergoing, but we need to sort of embrace it. And empathy is super at the core of it. I love, I'm going to give him a plug here. Uh, Dev uh, Lakau, I think I'm butchering his last name here right now, who's the CISO at Figma and got like a great background, you know, Dropbox. Oh yeah, Dev is pretty awesome, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Dev is just like brilliant in so many ways. And when I was on my podcast, he had this sort of a quote. It says like, when he comes to a developer and tells them, you know, they need to do something for them, he's almost apologetic about it. He says like, hey, I haven't figured out a way yet to make this problem go away from you. I haven't figured out some sort of, you know, magic fix or some platform thing that does it. And I'm sorry, but in the meantime, I'm going to need you to do this until I, you know, as I keep working, I'm trying to kind of make this problem not be in your sort of, in your sphere. And I just, you know, I love the humility of it. Humility is yeah. not massively prevalent in security. I know, and, and I think it is the sort of the secret of success for sort of DevOps and for DevSecOps, you know, and the best teams. Yeah, actually, one of our previous guests mentioned that I thought it's very relevant for this conversation as well. They mentioned that, and I truly believe this as well, modern security is about giving up control, 
Whereas the traditional security was about holding on to control. Like how many more things can I control was like the motto previously, but the modern security teams with the DevOps and automation and having the knowledge to be able to code, work with APIs, it's a lot more about what you called out, working with the developers and sometimes showing humility and apologizing because there's no better way to make this easier for them because technically yeah. you just want them to work. So 100%. Yeah, it is tough in security. So like, you know, again, not to, you know, we're, we're all on the hook and we still need to yeah, kind of work at right. it. Because it <laughs> done. A lot of DevOps was around embracing failure, right? Like in you know, mm. the early yeah. DevOps talks, you know, many of them at Velocity Conference, which was kind of my home ground, they revolved around, you know, like the, the first talks that came up on stage and said, I had an outage, we messed up. These are the things we did wrong. We did the analysis and sort of sharing those. Those were like, you know, heresy at the time, right? They were sort of so hard. The idea of doing that was really kind of poorly received. And a lot of the learning, a lot of the current ethos in DevOps and in continued deployment is to embrace the fact that failures will happen. And it's about how do you, you know, you want to prevent them, you want to learn them, but you also want to sort of iteratively get better at them. That's a much harder concept to embrace in security. It's harder to sort of imagine. And it happens, you know, people coming up on stage and saying, I messed up in security and I was hacked. Here's what <laughs> happened. You know, here's what we learned from it. Like, it, you know, there's legal ramifications. I had plugging my podcast here from time to time, but yeah, you know, like, but it's just like, it's an interesting story. So I had other folks from uh, CodeCov come along and, and talk about the breach that they had. And yep. I was so appreciative of it, you know, because... They came along and we talked about, you know, the breach itself, but we also talked about, you know, how they, how did they find out and how did they respond and the emotional journey of, of having that happen and the, sort of the approach, the great approach they took, which was very customer first. And, uh, and so I, you know, very much applaud them. And I think it's just, we don't have enough of it. It's yeah. hard to see it really become as common as, as it has been in, 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 in DevOps, you know, but it's hard. And, and I guess the key distinction is that in security, there is a villain. You know, and yeah, so in DevOps, yeah. in all these other disciplines that we talked about, it's all around building kind of a good software, but nobody's really out to get you. Nobody's yeah. out to try and sort of, you know, actually compete on the other side. Yeah. And in security, there is a villain. And so I don't think it's ever going to get to the same place, but at the same time, it needs to continue being the North Star, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's funny how you mentioned villains as well, because this is why Shilpi and I came up with the whole cloud security villains as well. It was the same concept, but essentially... Because everyone else doesn't really have an enemy, an outage. And I think maybe to your point, it's harder to talk about an incident on stage also because there's a potential loss of customer as well for people who are representing another company and come and talk about, hey, we had a data breach and this is the fault, third party supply chain or whatever. I mean, I don't, I'm not, not going to go into supply chain again, <laughs> but the whole conversation just becomes like, oh, I'm going to lose customers. People would you know, just stop working with us and they would yeah. just have this massive impact on financially impact as well. So it's definitely hard. I don't imagine it's easy. And it's not easy, especially when you have things like chat GPT and like the whole AI generative thing going on with GitHub Copilot and stuff coming in as well. People trying to use it. Because I think I had this conversation with the CISO where they were talking about the problem with GitHub Copilot is if I wanted to block my developers to upload code to GitHub Copilot, I can't because the code already in GitHub. Either I block completely GitHub or I don't do anything. So do you feel like the impacts of, and this is more, I'm sure leaders are already thinking about this from a data privacy perspective, but where do you see the impact of the whole generative AI space, like chat GPT and stuff in the whole cloud security, DevSecOps kind of space as well? Would they enable it or are they just basically like, you know, I guess it's going to fade away soon? I think so. I think generative AI is amazing and super powerful and I have no doubt it will, you know, greatly impact all worlds, including software, including, and it's sort of starting to show that. So I think we're talking about how, not if, you know, there's no doubt. I don't think it's a fad. It's tough. I think technology amplifies things. It amplifies the good and it amplifies the bad. And so when you look at open source, for instance, today, using an open source component, like open source software is not inherently more or less secure than, than closed source software. But the difference is that when, when a single open source component is being used by whatever, a million different organizations, then when there's a vulnerability in it, it is amplified because suddenly like a million targets are vulnerable. And so that's yeah. the real challenge with open source security. It's about that generated code. It has the same thing. You know, it's not about that code. There's a lot of problems at the moment. It oftentimes generates insecure code. Was a yeah. fundamental discomfort there or like you know challenge with saying that a textual text-based kind of code generation will generate 
good code because it doesn't understand what it's saying. You know, sort of, a, it's like learning from sort of a text. You know, there's a lot to sort of say about that. But what is definite is that when it generates code, it, if it has a problem, that problem will now permeate, you know, a lot of people. I think there's privacy elements around the code and all that. We have to deal with those. You know, there's copyright yeah. issues of like, you know, when you say, you know, create an image that looks like a Van Gogh image right now, you know, your whatever that, you know, sounds like, you know, right here's a story that's like a Stephen King story. You know, that's, yeah. those are like, there, there's like IP questions, you know, around it. I think in security land, I guess I like to think of myself as someone who anchors in the future. You know, I like to sort of, you know, think about where we're going and, and kind of trace a path back to today. In my opinion, Copilot, you know, while super helpful today, at the end of the day, code generation is a, that is a fact that would go away because what's the journey here, right? It auto-completes the code. At the moment, yeah. it auto-completes the code because it gets it. Auto-completion is the only place in which a tool can get it wrong nine times out of 10 and still be very useful to you because you type a letter, you type a letter, you type a letter. You know, after 20 letters, it got something, you know, an auto-completion thing. And then you say, oh, great, you know, I hit tab. That's not awesome for security assessment. That would not be an acceptable bar. And so you need more accuracy. At the end of the day, when it gets better at generating, it doesn't generate code, it generates functionality. And yep. so what I envision the future of sort of automated code generation is in components. We already have a methodology today around composability of yep. software, of reuse of software. And think like debugging someone else's code, including auto-generated code, is going to be very, very hard. Really, I think the destination of this is more around is more around defining functionalities, which to an yeah. extent will come back to the audit. It's interesting because it it sort of comes back to the bugs will be in poorly defined functionality, in sort of poor testing. You know, th those would be the gaps that prevent you from building something secure. So, and it's a super interesting world. As I think we said at some point during this, like legacy technology never dies. So I don't think anybody would be able to like wholesale shift. And I think the code completion is a good bridge to it. I, yep. I'll sort of say, you know, just like as a comment in sneak, you know, like how we're sort of putting the money to it is that we have this sort of two-prong approach. So we have generative AI or sort of code generation that we're doing. That's very slowly being rolled out right now. We had, a, a, I wouldn't call it AI, the automated code, the open source fixes that we've done. I wouldn't call that AI, but what we have in code itself is. And it combines the more aesthetic GPT based generate pretty code for me that looks like the code, the program that I'm in, and that's you know, is about right with, you know, R, we call it T5 engine that is accurate, that sort of says, and I can give you a very high level of assurance that it is indeed secure, has indeed fixed the vulnerability in question. And I think there's going to be combos like that, you know, GPT opened everybody's eyes. Yeah. I was in this world and it still opened my eyes further, you know, like, I think it's amazing. Uh, yeah. So ChatGPT was the, the marketing kind of play of the world and sort of exposing this technology of the history, you know, best in history. Yeah. But yeah, it'll be a brave new world. At the end of the day, you know, it'll come back to security hygiene. It'll come back to like locking your doors and, uh, and your windows and, and sort of ensuring that these basics are well handled because again, technology amplifies. And so whatever flaw yeah. here, it, the flaws wouldn't be very different, but the more auto-generated, the more you amplify the generation, the more you multiply the security risk. Sweet. And that was kind of like the uh, great answer, by the way. I love how you kind of anchor yourself in the future. I love that way of thinking about this as well. In the last couple of minutes that I have with you, I just wanted to quickly ask you three personal questions, not too personal, just to, so we will get an idea about who you are and what you kind of spend most of your time with, which brings me to my first rapid fire question, which is what do you spend most time on when you're not working on solving DevSecOps and cloud and all of these things we spoke about, what do you normally focus on at that point? Yeah, it's kind of ends up dividing between three things. I do a bunch of angel investment, uh, which I love sort of learning from other companies' journeys and sharing my learning. I, uh, we have a family foundation focusing on sort of social inequality. And so I, I kind of spend an increasing amount of my time trying to kind of help there and understand, you know, areas, whether it's immigration or sort of homelessness and, and topics of that nature, like with that. And, and much more sort of on the family side is, you know, my kids are, are both in sort of early secondary school years. So I've got maybe about five or six more years until they, you know, probably don't really want it at best, you know, of, uh, they don't want to spend time with me. So I try to spend, uh, think of creative ideas and trips and activities to do together. And so those are the, when, when I escape from that, I do some jigsaw puzzles. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, spend, figuring out how to spend more time with kids could be hard. It's a, it's a job in itself, at uh, some might say. It is, but it's super rewarding. Challenging. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not about it reward. Well, very rewarding. Yeah. Talking about rewards, what is something that you're proud of, but is not on your social media? Pr 
proud of and not on the social media. Well, I guess we were just on kids, you know, so like, like kids, <laughs> kids are such, they're such an ego trip. You know, you sort of, like you see, they go off, they succeed, whether it's, you know, whatever, my daughter dancing or my son playing the piano or beating me in chess or my, so, you know, you, you basically take pride in it. It's the only case in which you can kind of go in, do your best, lose and feel like you've won. So it's really great. Yeah. Otherwise I'm a fairly open person. So I, I talk about most of the stuff I do. Awesome. Final question. What's your favorite cuisine or restaurant that you can share with us? Ooh, I like a lot of good food on it. A bit, you know, so I like a lot of it. Maybe if you're ever in Israel, you know, I love a good, uh, so this is like a fried eggplant uh, aubergine. Right. Uh, basically a pita. The initials are for sort of salad, uh, egg and more eggplant. It's like the two letters. <laughs> so say more eggplant and it's delicious. And it's uh, sort of sits like a rock in your stomach after and they humidify the pita so it can stretch and hold more in it, which you enjoy in the moment and regret after. But uh, that's great, great street food that I love. But I love all of those two, three mission stars. You know, like I love a lot of good food. Yeah, wow. That's pretty awesome. I've been asking everyone this question. I've, I've got a book of favorite restaurants and cuisines of all these types of security people that I've collected. So one day we're going to release a book on the podcast, but whenever that day comes in, where can people find you when you're not enjoying food, I guess? Where can people find you more, to talk more about the whole DevSecOps and cloud security space? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on the socials, you know, I'm less active on the Twitter sphere now, but I'm at GuyPod there. I'm on LinkedIn, you know, it's easy to find me there and post. And I also share, you know, my podcast episodes and, you know, kind of the occasional thoughts over there. Those yeah. are probably the primary ones. And uh, yeah, look, a lot of the fruits of the labor and the mind are, are coming out on sneak on. So that's another one to find. I would definitely leave some links over there. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm definitely looking forward to having more conversation with you in the future as well, Guy. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Thank you.